Chapter Five, Part One of the Uttermost Farthing. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. The Uttermost Farthing by R. Austin Freeman. Chapter Five, Byproducts of Industry, Part One. The next entry in the amazing museum archives exhibited my poor friend Humphrey Challoner in circumstances that were to me perfectly incredible. When I recall that learned, cultivated man as I knew him. I find it in shop in an East End by street, yet this appears actually to have been his condition at one time. But let me quote the entry in his own words, which need no comments of mine to heighten their strangeness. Events connected with the acquirement of numbers seven, eight, and nine in the anthropological series. We are the creatures of circumstance. Blind chance, which guided that unknown wretch to my house in the dead of the night, and which led my dear wife to her death at his murderous hands. Also impelled that other villain, number six, anthropological series, to pursue me to the lonely chalk pit where he would have done me to death had I not fortunately anticipated his intentions. So too it was by a mere chance that I presently found myself the proprietor of a shop in a Whitechapel back street. Let me trace the connections of events. The first link in the chain was a visit that I had paid in my younger days to Moscow and Warsaw, where I had stayed long enough to acquire a useful knowledge of Russian and Yiddish. The second link was the failure of my plan to lure the murderer of my wife, and incidentally other criminals, to my house. The trap had been scented not only by the criminals but also by the police, of whom one had visited my museum, with very evident suspicion as to the nature of my specimens. After the visit of the detective, I was rather at a loose end. That unknown wretch was still at large. He had to be found, and I had to find him, since the police could not. But how? That detective had completely upset my plans, and, for a time, I could think of no other. Then came the dirty rascal who had tried to murder me in the chalk pit, and from his mongrel jargon, half cockney, half foreign, I had gathered a vague hint. If I could not entice the criminal population into my domain, how would it be to reconnoitre theirs? The alien area of London was well known to me, for it had always seemed interesting since my visit to Warsaw, and, Judging from the police reports, it appeared to be a veritable happy hunting ground for the connoisseur in criminals. Hence it was that my unrest led me almost daily to perambulate that strange region east of Aldgate, where uncouth foreign names stare out from the shop signs, and almost every public or private notice is in the Hebrew character. Dressed in my shabbiest clothes, I trudged, hour after hour and day after day, through the grey and joyless streets and alleys, looking earnestly into the beady eyes and broad faces of the East European wayfarers, and wondering whether any of them was the man I sought. One evening, as I was returning homeward through the district that lies at the rear of Middlesex Street, my attention was arrested by a large card tacked on the door of a closed shop. A dingy barber's pole gave a clue to the nature of the industry formerly carried on, and the card, which was written upon in fair and even scholarly Hebrew characters, supply particulars. I had stopped to read the inscription, faintly amused at the incongruity between the recondite oriental lettering and the matter-of-fact references to eligible premises and fixtures and goodwill, when the door opened and two men came out. One was a typical English Jew, smart, chubby, and prosperous. The other was evidently a foreigner. Both men stood aside to enable me to continue my reading, and, as I was about to turn away, the smarter of the two addressed me. "'Good chance here, mister. Nice a little business going for nothing. No charge for goodwill or fixtures. Ready-made business, and nothing to pay but rent.' "'Yah,' the other man broke in. "'That shop is a lead a gold mine, and you buys him for nodding. It was an absurd situation. I was beginning smilingly to shake my head when the Jew resumed eagerly. "'I tell you, mister, if a chance in a million a fifth class binneth, and not a brown to pay for the goodwill. Come in and have a look round, he added persuasively. I suppose I am curious by nature. At any rate, I am sure it was nothing but idle curiosity to see what the interior of a Whitechapel house was like that led me to follow the two men into the dark and musty-smelling shop. But hardly had my eyes lighted on the frowsy fixtures and appurtenances of the trade when there flashed into my mind a really luminous idea. "'Why did the last man leave?' I asked. The Jew caught hold of my coat and exclaimed impressively, 
the lath man what the fool got himself mixed up with the crooketh set up a roulette table in the cellar and let em come in and gamble away their thwag stupid thing to do though mind you he did a rare good line while it lasted got the stuff for nothing you thee his tone in this point was regretfully sympathetic what happened in the end i asked the copper dropped on him somebody gave him away some of the ladies perhaps i suggested ach so the other man burst in fiercely of course it was their women it is always their women dese damn women they makes all their trouble he thumped on the table with his fist and then catching the hebrew's eye suddenly subsided into silence from the shop we proceeded to the little parlor behind from which a door gave access by a flight of most dangerous stone steps to the large cellar this was lighted by a grating from the back yard with which it also communicated by a flight of steps and a door we next examined the yard itself a small paved enclosure with a gate opening on an alley and occupied at the moment by an empty beer barrel a builder's handcart and a dead cat like to thee the up there th room inquired the hebrew gentleman whose name i understood to be nathan i nodded abstractedly and followed him up the stairs gathering a general impression of all pervading dirt the upper rooms were of no interest to me after what i had seen downstairs well said mr nathan when we were once back in the shop what do you think of it i did not answer his question literally if i had i should have startled him for i thought the place absolutely ideal for my purpose just consider its potentialities i was searching for a criminal whom i could identify by his hair here was a barber shop in the heart of a criminal neighborhood and admittedly the late haunt of criminals those criminals were certain to come back i could examine their hair at my leisure and there was the cellar it was i repeat absolutely ideal i think the place will suit me i said mr nathan beamed on me of course he said reference will be necessary or rent in advance a year's rent in advance will do i suppose said i and mr nathan nearly jumped clear off the floor a few minutes later i departed the accepted tenant under the pseudonym of simon bosper of samuel nathan with the understanding that i should deliver my advance rent in banknotes and that he should have the top dressing of dirt removed from the house and the name of bosper painted over the shop my preparations for the new activities on which i was to enter were quickly made in my bloomsbury house i installed as caretaker a retired sergeant major of incomparable taciturnity i locked up the museum wing and kept the keys i took a few lessons in hair cutting from a west end barber i paid my advance rent sent in a set of bedroom furniture to my new premises in saul street whitechapel abandoned the habit of shaving for some ten days and then took possession of the shop at first the customers were few and far between a stray coster or carman came in from time to time but mostly the shop was silent and desolate but this did not distress me i had various preparations to make and a plan of campaign to settle there were the cellar stairs for instance a steep flight of stone steps unguarded by baluster or handrail they were very dangerous but when i had fitted a sort of giant stride by suspending a stout rope from the ceiling i was able to swing myself down the whole flight in perfect safety other preparations consisted in the placing of an iron safe in the parlor with a small mirror above it and the purchase of a tin of stiff cart grease and a few large barrels these latter i brought from a cooper in the form of staves and hoops and built them up in the cellar in my rather extensive spare time meanwhile trade gradually increased the harmless coster and laborer began to be varied by customers rather more in my line in fact i had not quite completed my arrangements when i got the first windfall it was a wednesday evening i had nearly finished shaving a large military-looking laborer when the door opened very quietly and a seedy middle-aged man entered and sat down his movements were silent almost stealthy and when he had seated himself he picked up a newspaper from behind which i saw him steal furtive and suspicious glances at the patient in the operating chair the latter being scraped clean rose to depart and the newcomer underwent a total eclipse behind the newspaper Uzi he demanded when the laborer was safely outside i don't know him i replied but i should say by his hands a laborer looked rather like a copper said my customer he took his place in the vacated chair with a laconic air cut and then became conversational so you've took on polensky's job i nodded in the mirror that faced us polensky was my predecessor and he continued polensky's doing time ain't he 
I believed he was, and said so. And my friend then asked, "'Young Pongo ever come in here now?' Naturally, I had never heard of young Pongo, but I felt that I must not appear too ignorant. It were better to invent a little. "'Pongo,' I ruminated. "'Pongo. Is that the fellow who is with Joe Bartles in this job at, er, you know?' "'No, I don't,' said my friend. "'And who's Joe Bartles?' "'Oh, I thought you knew him. But if you don't, I'd better say no more. You see, I don't know who you are.' "'Don't yer? Then I'll tell yer. I'm Spotty Bamber, of Spitalfields. That's who I am. So now you know.' I made a mental note of the name, the first part of which had apparently been suggested by Mr. Bamber's complexion. And my attention must have wandered somewhat, for my patient suddenly shouted, "'Ear! I say! I didn't come here to be scalped! I come to have my air cut!' I apologized and led the conversation back to Polensky. "'Ah,' said Bamber, "'e was a downian, e was. Bit too downy. Opened his mouth too wide. Wanted it all for nix. That was why he got peached on.' Here Spotty turned his head with a jerk. "'What are you looking at me through that thing for? My ed ain't as small as all that.' That thing was a Coddington lens, through which I examined the hair of every customer with a view to identification. But I did not tell Mr. Bamber this. My explanation was recondite and rather obscure, but it seemed to satisfy him. "'Well,' he said, "'you're a rum cove. Talk like a bloomin' toff, too, you do.' I made a careful mental note of that fact, and determined to study the local dialect. Meanwhile, I explained, I wasn't always a hairdresser, you know. "'So I should suppose,' answered Spotty, twisting his neck to get a look at his pole in the glass. "'What you'd call a bloomin' amateur. He stood up, shook himself, and tendered a half-crown in payment, which I examined carefully before giving change. Then I brought out of my pocket a handful of assorted coins, including two sovereigns, a quantity of silver, and some coppers. I do not ordinarily carry my money mixed up in this slovenly fashion, but had adopted the habit, since I came to the shop, for a definite reason, and was now justified by the avaricious glare that lighted up in Spotty's eyes at the sight of the coins in my hand. I picked out his change deliberately and handed it to him, when he took it and stood for a few seconds, evidently thinking hard. Suddenly he thrust his hand into his pocket and said, "'I suppose, mister, you haven't got such a thing as a five-pun note what you can give me in exchange for five jimmies. He held out five sovereigns, which I took from him and inspected critically. "'Oh, they're all right,' said Spotty, as I weighed them in my hand, and so they were. "'I think I can let you have a note if you will wait a moment,' I said, and as I turned to enter the parlour Spotty sat down ostentatiously in the chair. I drew the door to after me, but did not latch it. A small jet of gas was burning in the parlour, and by its light I unlocked the safe, pulled out a drawer, took from it a bundle of banknotes and looked them over, all very deliberately and with my eye on the mirror that hung above the safe. That mirror reflected the door. It also reflected me, but as the light was on my back my face was in the shadow. Hardly had I opened the safe when, slowly and silently, the door opened a couple of inches and an eye appeared in the space. I picked a note out of the bundle, returned the remainder to the drawer, closed the safe and slowly walked to the door. When I re-entered the shop, Spotty was seated in the chair as I had left him, with the immovable air of an Egyptian statue. I have no doubt that Spotty Bamber chuckled with joy when he got outside. I should like to think so, to feel that our pleasure was mutual. For as to me, my feelings can only be appreciated by some patient angler who, after a long and fruitless setting, has seen his quill or cork sink down with eager bite of perch on bleak or dace. Spotty was on the hook. He would come again, and not alone, at least I trusted not alone, for my brief inspection of his hair had convinced me that he was not the unknown man whom I sought, and though he would make an acceptable addition to the group of specimens in the long wall-case, I was more interested in the companion whom I felt confident he would bring with him. The elation of spirit produced by the prospect of this second visit was such that I forthwith closed the shop, and spent the rest of the evening exercising with the concussor and practicing flying leaps down the cellar steps with the aid of the giant stride. I slept little that night. As a special precaution against failure, I had left the back gate unbolted and refrained from locking the outside cellar door, with the sole result that I was roused up at one in the morning by a meddlesome constable and rebuked sourly for my carelessness. Otherwise not a soul came to enliven my solitude. The second night passed in the same dull fashion, leaving me restless and disappointed. 
and when the third slipped by without a sign of a visitor, I became uneasy. The fourth day was Saturday, and late evening, the end of the Sabbath, turned my shop into a veritable land of Goshen. The conversation, mostly in Yiddish, of which I professed total ignorance, kept me pretty well amused until closing time arrived. Then, as the shop emptied, my hopes and fears began to revive together. I was about to begin shutting up the premises when the door opened softly and a man slipped into the shop. My heart leaped exultingly. The man was Spotty Bamber. And he was not alone. By no means. Two more men stroll in, in the same stealthy fashion, and having first glanced at one another, and then peered suspiciously round the shop, they all looked at me. For my part, I regarded them with deep interest, especially as to their hair. Habitual criminal was written large on all of them. As anthropological material they were quite excellent. Mr. Bamber opened the proceedings with one eye on me and the other on the door. "'Look here, mister. We've come about a little matter of business. You know Polensky used to do a bit of trade?' "'Yes,' I said, and now he's doing a bit of time. "'I know,' replied Spotty. "'But you must take that fat with the lean. It ain't all soup. And you know that Polensky was a bloomin' fool.' "'It comes to this ear said one of the other men, stepping up close to me. "'Do you know a jerry when you sees one? A red un, mind you.' I had not the faintest idea what the man meant. I temporized. "'I haven't seen one yet, you know.' The fellow looked furtively at the door, and then, diving into an inner pocket, pulled out a handsome gold watch with a massive chain attached, exhibited it for a moment, and then dropped it back. "'That's the little article,' he said. "'And before you makes a bid, you can look it over and try if the stuff's genuine.' But not out here, you know. We does our deal inside where you can't get oogled by a copper through the winder. I saw the plan at a glance, and in the main approved, though three at once was a bigger handful than I should have desired. They would require careful treatment. I will just go and see that it's all clear, I said, and with this I retired to the parlor, quietly bolting the door behind me. End of chapter 5, part 1